keys and chords. Hi, I'm Marv. Welcome to Keys and Chords, an introduction to the piano keyboard and a little more. After this session, you'll be able to identify all the keys on the keyboard, understand how scales are constructed, name the interval between any two keys, recognize and create chords, and start to understand chord progressions. Now that may seem like a lot, but really it's more straightforward than you might think. So, let's get started. On a full keyboard, there are 88 keys. That includes all the black keys. And the black keys are in groupings of two and three. Two, three, two, three, two, three. All the way up and down the keyboard. This is one of three believe it or not. Now the middle black key in any grouping of three defines how we start naming the white keys. Let me repeat that. The middle black key in any grouping of three defines how we start naming the white keys. The white key to the right of the middle black key is A. That is the first letter of the English alpha alphabet. <clears throat> that A. The white key to the right of A is called B. Isn't that clever? By the way, moving to the right on the keyboard is known as going up. And as you might imagine, going to the left is going down. Up, down. So we got that cleared up. So if we go up the keyboard, naming the white keys starting with A, we use the first seven letters of the English alphabet. So we have A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we start again with A. And the last white key named winds up to the left of the middle black key in the next grouping of three black keys. Then we start over. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, which winds up being to the left of the middle black key. So we start to the right of the middle black key in a grouping of three. We go up the keyboard, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and we are now to the left of the middle black key, and we keep going up the keyboard. Notice that A is always to the right of the middle black key in the grouping of three black keys. Notice also that only the white keys have names. However, black keys matter because without them, a pianist wouldn't know one key from another. Imagine a keyboard with only white keys. I'm trying to imagine it. Oh, never mind. It is what it is. Just accept it. By the way, notes going up the keyboard get higher, and going down they get lower. So B is higher than A, and so on. Why is that? Well, here's a little physics. Now, if you don't like science, don't get all nervous and jerky. This won't hurt a bit, and it's quick. Here goes. You know, when you press a key on the keyboard, it sets a tiny felt-covered hammer in motion, and the hammer hits some strings, and the strings vibrate, like this, only much faster. The A key, approximately in the middle of the keyboard, sets strings to vibrate at 440 cycles per second, and sounds like this. When you pick up the key, there's a damper that, that hits the strings and stops the sound. Unless you hold a pedal, which lifts up the damper. So this is approximately 440 cycles per second. If we play the key an octave up the keyboard, that is the next A, its strings vibrate at 880 cycles per second, exactly 
twice the number of vibrations as A440. And of course, if we strike the A key below A440, we get A220, meaning that its strings vibrate at exactly 220 cycles per second. 220, 440, 880. I don't know what that is. If I could calculate it quick enough, I'd tell you. By the way, I used the word octave and didn't explain it. So here's a C. An octave above that key is eight keys higher. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oct meaning eight. Remember, that means it's twice the number of cycles per second. We just talked about that, right? Pay attention. I know you are. Now, this particular C is often called little c because it's, well, it's obvious, isn't it? That's about the middle of the piano keyboard. Its strings vibrate at about 523 cycles per second. Not that you should care. I actually had to look that up. Okay, back to the black keys. If black keys have no names, how do we refer to them? We refer to them using the names of the white keys. Here's the rule. The black key to the immediate right going up the keyboard is called a sharp. So the black key to the right of A is called A sharp. The black key to the right of D, A, B, C, D, is called D sharp. But every black key has two identifiers. That's because the person who invented this system felt sorry for not naming the poor black keys. So she allowed two ways to identify them. That's a lie, but it was fun to say. So the second way to identify a black key is by this rule. The black key to the immediate left going down the keyboard is called a flat. So the black key to the left of A is called A flat. Notice that it's also called G sharp. Funny, huh? Let's take another key. <clears throat> this is a D, A, B, C, D. And this is a D flat. And this is a D sharp. Notice that D-sharp is also E-flat. E, E-flat. E so what's E-sharp? Well, here's the rub. Sharps and flats, which are called incidentals, by the way. You can say incidental, can you? Very good. Incidentals are usually used just to identify the black keys but sometimes it's convenient on a piece of sheet music to refer to an F as an E-sharp. E-sharp is an F, and E as an F-flat. Similarly for B and C, because they're two white keys together, B-sharp, C-flat. <clears throat> Not to worry, you will hardly ever see that. But I'm just warning you in case you come upon it, so you don't say, hey, Marv lied to me. I didn't. It was just a little fib. Basically, sharps and flats are there to refer to the black keys. So now that you know how to refer to each key, let me explain to you half tones and whole tones. Half tones, by the way, are also called semitones, and whole tones are also called full tones. A half tone is the distance and sound between two adjacent keys, whether black or white, whether up or down the keyboard. So A to A sharp is a half tone. A to A flat is also a half tone. B to C is a half tone. Here are some other half tones. distance between any two keys is called an interval, and a half tone is the smallest interval. Every interval has a name. 
For example, an octave, remember that? Is an interval. That's an octave, that's an octave, that's an octave. Ready for another physics lesson? Last one, I promise. I always wondered how one note relates to another, so I looked it up, and I thought you'd like to know. I told you about cycles per second, right? Also known as frequency. As a reminder, it's the number of times a string vibrates in a second. Well, on all modern instruments, we're dealing with what's known as the equally tempered scale. A scale being a series of notes. We'll talk more about that later. Equally tempered scale. My mother used to say I had a temper, but I think she was talking about something else. In the equally tempered scale, the frequency of any note is about 1.06 times the frequency of the half note below it. So if an A is 440 cycles per second, an A sharp is about 1.06 times 440, which is 466 cycles per second. Take that to your trivia buddies. Here's another interval called a full tone, basically two half tones. So starting on C, going up a full tone lands you on D. <laughs> going down a full tone from C is two half tones, lands you on a B flat. A major scale consists of these two intervals, half tones and full tones. Let's start on a D. I'll play the whole scale for you first, and I'm sure the sound will be familiar to you. We're going down. <clears throat> now let's look at the intervals. Starting on D, we go up a full tone. Then another full tone. Then we go up a half tone. Three more full tones. And finally, another half tone to bring us back to D. So a major scale going up consists of two full tones, then a half tone, then three full tones, and another half tone. Full, full, a half, full, 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 a half. Going down is the same thing in reverse. Let me do that again. Watch this. Starting on D, full, full, a half, right? Full, 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 half. That sequence holds for whatever key you start on. Let's start on B. A lot of black keys in the key of B. Now C. Full, full, a half, full, 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 a half. Oh, look. The major scale in C is all white keys. Who'd have thunk it? Clearly, how many black keys you have in a scale depends upon what key you start with. We've seen so far that every white key in a scale can be named and every black key can be identified as either a sharp or a flat. And you can now play a major scale starting on any key. Now, I want to tell you about intervals, other than half tones, full tones, and octaves that we've already discussed. Every interval, the distance between any two keys, also has a name. To illustrate that concept, let's take any scale and number the keys instead of naming them. Using the C scale, because it's all white keys and it's easy to look at, we start on a C, <clears throat> which we call one. Then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And we wind up on C again. You already know that the interval from C to D is called a full tone. The interval from C to E is called a third. That is, we're using the number three to determine the interval name. 
Why? Well, E is the third note in a C scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, etc. So the interval from C to F, the fourth note in the C scale, one, two, three, four, is called, you guessed it, a fourth. And this is a fifth. Then a sixth, a seventh, and we're back to an octave. <clears throat> well, what about the keys we didn't play, the ones not in the C scale, like this one? Right, that's not in the C scale. Well, from C to E flat, or D sharp, of course, is an interval known as a minor third. We know this one, of course, This one is a half tone, right? Very good. You've been paying attention. How about this one? <clears throat> Might be a tough one to remember, so listen up. It's called a diminished fifth. Here's the fifth. One, two, three, four, five, right? Here's the fifth, and this is a diminished fifth. Sounds like... Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. Right? From West Side Story. Maria, that's how I remember what a uh, diminished fifth sounds like. Then the fifth note, sharped, if this is a diminished fifth, the fifth note sharp is augmented. So this interval, C to G sharp, is an augmented fifth. The diminished and augmented fifths are not common intervals to sing, and I personally have trouble with them. But you'll see them in chords, and we'll get to that shortly. Okay, just one more interval and a short discussion about sevenths. This interval, C to B flat, is a diminished seventh. This being the seventh, right? Seven, diminished seven. More commonly called just a seventh, because the interval using the actual seventh note in the scale, this interval, is called a major seventh. Also, the diminished seventh, or just the seventh, It's much more common in most music and is also called and is also called the dominant seventh. I had to think about that. In barbershop quartet harmony, it's often called a barbershop seventh. By the way, these intervals apply in any key. Let's use the G scale, which has one sharp. Whoops. Again, we'll use the numbers 1 through 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Instead of the names of the keys, so we have uh, 1 through 8, right? Let's name the intervals. 1, half tone, full tone, minor third, third, fourth, diminished fifth, fifth, augmented fifth. just the seventh, major seventh, and an octave. Let's do that in B flat, which has two flats. The two flats are B flat and E flat. Here's the scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Naming the intervals, half tone, Full tone, minor third, third, fourth, diminished fifth, fifth, augmented fifth, sixth, dominant seventh, major seventh. 
seventh an octave. Got that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One. Minor third, third. Major seventh octave. So now it's time to congratulate you. Consider what you've learned. You know how to name every white key on the keyboard. You also know how to refer to each one of the black keys, if that's all you got from this session so far, I applaud you. But you probably can also name every interval. That is the distance between any two keys. So in summary, starting with F, for example, here are the intervals. Half tone, full tone, minor third, third, fourth, diminished fifth, fifth, augmented fifth, sixth, dominant seventh, or just the seventh, major seventh, and octave. Don't worry if you don't remember each of these names. You'll remember them just from use. And we're about to use them because we're about to introduce you to... Chords. This is easier than you might think and very rewarding, so here goes. There are three types of chords that I think you should know about. Major, minor, and diminished chords. I'll start with the major chords. There are 12 major chords. The basic chord is a triad because the basis for a major chord consists of three notes. Here's an A chord. Here's the A scale. Triad is one, three, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, three, five. Remember the rule for me play, uh, playing a major scale, starting with A, full tone, full tone, half tone, full, 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 half, right? So one, three, five, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Notice that one, three, and five are the keys that comprise a basic chord, starting with any key as one, also known as the root of the chord. An A chord is the chord with the key A at its root. That is number one. Let's do the same thing with A flat. Ooh, that's a tough one. Here's the scale, let's count. One, two, three, construct all 12 major chord. Here's a G chord, a G sharp chord, or A flat chord, A chord, all the way up the scale, right? And we wind up again on a G chord an octave above the first chord we played, but it's still a G chord, right? Here's the first chord we played, one, three, five. Up here, one, three, five, same thing. In fact, if I take any note from this chord and play it in a different octave, it's still a G chord. One, three, five. That's a G chord, right? One, three, five. That's a G chord. It's called an inversion of the G chord. There are a huge number of inversions of a G chord. For example, one, 
so challenging and so much fun, the inversions. Notice that chords can be tighter at the upper part of the keyboard than at the lower part, where uh, tight chords tend to sound muddy, or even muddier. Ooh. So at the lower part of the keyboard, we tend to use inversions that spread out the chord. Take this B and put it here. That's a lot better than that, or same here, right, is better than that. But up here, that's okay, but that works as well. So tighter chords at the top, more spread chords at the bottom. Now let me tell you about minor chords. Remember the interval called a minor third? It's two keys that are three half tones apart. This, C to C sharp, is a half tone. Two half tones, or a full tone. And C to E flat, that's a minor third. This is a third, a major third, also called a third. Half tone, half tone, which is a full tone, minor third, a third. A major chord is one, three, five, right? So if we flat the third, we're flatting the E to an E flat. The root C in this case to the E flat is a minor third. A minor chord is one, three, one, three, five, with the third flatted. Here's the major chord, minor chord. And you can hear how kind of sad or melancholy that sounds. C, E flat, G. Here's a C sharp major chord. And here's a C sharp minor chord. Hear how melancholy that sounds? D major chord, one, three, five, and D minor chord, one, three, flat, five, and so on. E flat major, E flat minor, E major, E minor, F major, F minor. So now you know all 12 minor chords. Wow, you're pretty smart. Take a bow. You deserve it. Okay, that's enough. There's one more basic chord you need to learn. It's called the diminished fifth or diminished chord. And by now you might guess what that means. You take a minor chord and flat, that is diminish, the fifth. Right? One, three, five is major. One, three, flat. Five is minor. And this is a diminished chord. So we have uh, C minor and diminish the fifth. Now that's a very strange chord. Uh, take a look. C to E flat is a minor third, three and a half tones, the three half tones. Half tone, half tone, half tone, minor third, three half tones, right? And E flat to G flat, the diminished fifth, right? is another minor third. Half tone, half tone, half tone, is another minor third. That's three half tones. If you add another minor third up the keyboard, that's A, right? Which is only a minor third back to C. So adding the A gives us a four note chord, which we can call a C diminished chord. But here's the rub. This chord really has no root, so to speak. If we put the C up here, giving us an inversion of the C diminished chord, 
we can easily call it an E flat diminished chord, right? All successive notes in the chord are exactly a minor third from the next note. So you can say that the chord has no root, or that every note in the chord is the root. The point is, any inversion of a diminished chord can be called by the name of any note in the chord. So there is a C diminished chord, E flat diminished chord, F sharp diminished chord, or G flat diminished chord, <clears throat> and A diminished chord, and we're back to a C diminished chord, and I'm just calling them by names of the lowest note in the chord. And of course, if I take that F sharp and put it down here, it's still a C diminished chord, or you could call it an F sharp diminished chord. So there are only three diminished chords because that's a C diminished chord, that's a C sharp diminished chord, that's a D diminished chord, and now we have an E flat diminished chord, but wait, that's just an inversion of that one. So really there are only three diminished chords, right? So now you know 12 minor, 12 major, and 3 diminished chords. That's 27 chords plus their inversions. That's a huge number of chords. And you can play lots of songs with those chords, or accompany yourself with some simple chords. Let's take a simple song, just the way you look tonight. Sometime when I'm awfully low, when the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you. And the way you look tonight. Okay, let's put some chords to that. <clears throat> uh, the four chords that we're going to use are C major, A minor, D minor, and G major. And you might know those as the heart and soul chords. chords go just by hearing it. Sometime when I'm sometime when I'm awfully low when the world is cold I will feel a glow just thinking of you and the way you look tonight and we're back to see sometime Inversions. Some, sometime when I'm awfully low, when the world is cold, I will feel a glow just thinking of you and the way you look tonight. Now I just played only three note chords, the basic chords or triads we just discussed when talking about major and minor chords. But we can color up those chords to make them more interesting by adding six or sevens. Why add six or seven and not two or four to the one, three, five sequence? Because we like harmony and we usually want to avoid dissonance. Three notes very close together don't usually sound great, like this. So if we have one, three, five and we add the second, doesn't sound great. If we have one, three, five, and we have the fourth, that doesn't sound great. <clears throat> but if we add a six, that sounds pretty good and interesting. Or if we take the three note chord and add a dominant seventh, remember that? One, two, three, four, five, six, dominant seven, major seventh, and add the dominant seventh. <clears throat> That's pretty harmonious as well, don't you think? So if we add a six, that's this interval, the name of the chord, one, three, five, six, just like the interval, is a C6. And the name of this chord is a dominant seven, a C dominant seven, just like this interval. 
Major sevenths are less common because if they're too tight, they sound dissonant. Whereas separated, mm, let's do this. Or put the G down here. That's a pretty interesting chord, right? For example, in the song, uh, Nevertheless, uh, which starts with, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm right, and there's a major seventh chord, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm weak, right, and maybe I'm strong, so you're going from a major seventh here, maybe I'm weak, to a resolves to a sixth, right? Maybe I'm right, and maybe I'm wrong, and maybe I'm another major seventh. I'm weak. Sometimes a song demands a major seventh, as in this case. I want to focus for now, however, on the dominant seventh chord, because it leads ultimately to what I call the tonal center of the song. That is, the key that the song is written in. When we see a key signature on a piece of sheet music, like one sharp or three flats or whatever, that tells us what key the song is written in because there is only one major scale that uses those particular incidentals. Remember that word? Incidentals are sharps and flats. A C scale has no sharps or flats. So if you see no sharps or flats in the key signature, then you know that it's in the key of C. An A scale has three sharps. C sharp, F sharp, and G sharp, right? An F scale has one flat. So if you see a key signature with one flat, you know that you're in the key of F. So what exactly does that mean to be in the key of something? It means that if the key signature has one flat, F is the tonal center of the song. The song is arranged in, in the key of F. That's what we say. F is the tonal center. Most of the chords of the song ultimately lead to the basic F chord. And the song usually ends on that chord. By the way, songs in the minor key are somewhat different, and while it's not complex at all, we're not going to go there. Not here. Here are some examples of how chords lead to the key in which the total, uh, uh, the key that is, that is, the total center of the song. So let me take uh, something in the key of C. This is a song from Where's Charlie? It's uh, all of these songs are written by this genius, Frank Lesser. And it's called Springtime, <clears throat> or actually Lovelier Than Ever from the show called Where's Charlie? And uh, it's written in the key of C. Now there are chords that lead to C. For example, everything that is in this song leads essentially to, to the C chord. The song goes like this. Springtime, you're looking lovelier than ever. So let me 
let's take the last part of this springtime, which starts on say springtime. You haven't changed your way of whispering, whispering, and we're back on C, whispering, that romance C again, lies in the store. Springtime, you're being devastatingly clever and lovelier than ever. that just lead to the next chord. And when we're in the key of C, they lead ultimately to a C chord. That's the point of tonal center. Let's look at another one. This is in the key of F with a one flat, where the major chord is F, right? I'll know. When my love comes along, I'll know then and there. I'll know at the sight of her face how I care, how I care, how I care. And I'll stop and I'll stare. And I'll know long before we can speak, I'll know in my heart. I won't harass. Am I wise? Am I smart? Am I right? But I'll stop and I'll stare at that face in the throng. Yes, I'll know when my love comes along. And so that's the end of the song, right? Now it repeats and there's a bridge, and then, but basically that's the song. <clears throat> So we're in the key of F. We wind up on an F, right? Everything leads to that F. I'll know, and I won't ever ask. Am I right? Am I wise? This is an F major seventh. Wise? Am I smart? But I'll stop. And I'll stare at that face in the throng. Yes, I'll know when my love comes along. No, when my love comes along. There's a progression of chords that just leads back to the original chord. So that's what it means when we say that something is written in a particular key. I'll, I'll do one more. This is Once in Love with Amy, which is in the key of G, which has one sharp. And G chord, one, three, five, is that. Once in love with Amy, always in love with Amy. something. 
So you can see how chords in a song ultimately lead to the key that the song is written in. And the most common leading chord is the dominant seventh. By the way, in barbershop quartet singing, it's also called a barbershop seventh because there's a predominance of dominant seventh chords in most barbershop arrangements. When we talk about one chord leading to another, we're talking about what's known as chord progressions, and I've used that word. Probably the most common progression is the dominant seventh chords in something called the circle of fifths. Let me explain. In any triad, the fifth up from the root of the chord can be the root of a different chord. And that second chord leads to the first one. For example, an A chord, one, three, five, has as its fifth note from the root an E, one, two, three, four, five. We take that E as the root of a new chord, one, three, five. And if we add the dominant seventh, six, seven, that chord, you can see how that leads back to A. We can use that E chord as another example, asking the question, what chord leads to E? Well, the fifth up from E is B. One, three, five. <clears throat> so the dominant seventh to E, the dominant seventh of the B, or, or some version of that, some leads to E. Now if B leads to E, and E leads to A, wouldn't that make a nice progression? Yes, it does. So we have... Seven leads to A. Right? Also, if you use B minor instead of that, that also works. Now, <clears throat> If it, as it turns out, if we keep going up the keyboard by fifths, look what happens, starting with A down here, right? That's an A, that's an A, right? There are no three here, three black keys, but that's an A. And the fifth up is E, the fifth up from E is B, the fifth up from B is F sharp, the fifth up from F sharp is C sharp, C sharp, fifth up is G sharp, fifth up from G sharp is E flat or D sharp, E flat, fifth up is B flat, B flat, fifth up is F, fifth up from F is C, fifth up from C is G, fifth up from G is D, fifth up from D is A. Oh, look at that. It brought us all the way back to A. If we go up from fifth by fifths all up the keyboard, we get back to where we started, and that's called the circle of fifths. So E leads to A, A leads to D, D leads to G. Cute, huh? So, for example, we could start with G. Add the dominant seventh, that leads to C. If you add a dominant seventh to C, that leads to F. Right? If we add the dominant seventh to F, that leads to B flat. Dominant seventh. to be
here's a question. Is all of this just musical trivia, or is it actually useful? To which I say, who cares? I had fun. I hope you did too. This is Mar Marv Winchell signing off. Oh, I know my name. Marv Winchell signing off. <laughs> Bye.